America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. the coming of spring, 1944, the winter stalemate in Italy was broken. Our forces slowly resumed fighting their way up the west coast of the Italian boot toward Rome against bitter German opposition. advanced up the east coast in the face of equally bitter opposition. In the Pacific, troops of the 1st Cavalry Division landed on Los Negros and Manus Islands in the Admiralty Group to wipe out all Japanese resistance and complete occupation of the entire group of islands. We landed large forces at Hollandia and Aitape on the north coast of New Guinea. General Stilwell and his troops were fighting the Japanese in Burma. This was global warfare on a scale never known before. Less than three years before, Hitler had addressed the Reichstag. Germany, Italy, and Japan will wage common war upon the United States to a victorious conclusion. In Rome, his fascist partner had declared, Fascist Italy and National Socialist Germany, ever closely linked, participate from today on the side of heroic Japan against the United States. A Japanese militarist joined the derisive chorus. Americans have radios, automobiles, big beefsteaks. When a people has those things, they don't want to fight. Americans won't sleep in hammocks or lie in trenches. They are like a tiger whose stomach is full. They are sleepy. The American is no soldier. American, no soldier. And yet there he was, carrying the fight to the boastful aggressor.
the self-acclaimed Superman was learning to his bitter surprise and sorrow the fighting qualities of the American soldier. It seems the aggressors had made a slight miscalculation. In Italy, our forces pushed on through rain and mud, over mountains, across rivers, toward Rome. power drive up the Italian boot forced the enemy to divert 30 of his divisions from France and the Low Countries, weakening his defenses along the English Channel coast, where our invasion of France was soon to come. We now had an army numbering millions of soldiers. We now had 150,000 armored vehicles as compared to the 29 tanks the Army had in 1940. 400,000 artillery pieces were now engaged in the war effort compared to the 235 available in 1940. From a 1940 production capacity of 117 aircraft a month, we were now producing 9,000 planes of all types a month, a plane every five minutes, 12 an hour. Here now was an air arm of 150,000 planes supporting the coordinated allied effort to wipe out enemy industry, supply routes, and communication facilities. American tiger grown sleepy on a full stomach, or so the Japanese had thought, was now fully awake, lean, and fighting in the jungles. General Stilwell, with his Chinese and American forces, is back in Burma fighting Japs. And the Army's 10th Air Force is keeping them well supplied with an aerial freight line. This is the first time Uncle Joe has had a crack at the Japs since his gallant retreat two years ago when he said, we got a hell of a beating in Burma, but we'll be back. And now he's on his way to cut the enemy supply lines, feeding the Japs now invading India. There are few casualties so far, and those are in the hands of Colonel Gordon Seagrave. Another hero of the retreat with Stilwell in 42, pictured here by the Signal Corps camera. With the medical unit are veteran Burmese nurses who help prepare severely wounded men for the flight to base hospitals. Stilwell's on the road back. Our entire Anzio Nituno beachhead area is within range of German artillery. But well-timed teamwork between the various services, making up the 5th Army, keeps everything under control. In the battle for air supremacy, we lose one now and then. And our losses are not counted in planes alone. A crew member is put out of the running temporarily. But our losses are small compared to the number of German planes shot down from the skies. A water tower used by the Nazis to get our range is destroyed. Signal Corps pictures show a communications post, the nerve center of modern attack. The infantry is on the job, too. In dead and wounded, the Nazi figures top our losses by a wide margin. 
Examination of prisoners reveals that prize German troops are becoming scarce on this front. However, natural mountain defenses offer stubborn resistance. Plenty of prisoners, but it's a rocky road to Rome. On the 4th of June, 1944, our 5th Army captured Rome. It was a military victory, yes, but its psychological effect carried the greater impact throughout the world. For it was the first Axis capital to fall into our hands, bringing consternation and foreboding to the enemy, and fresh heart and rejoicing to the free world and its fighting forces. is European invasion in the making. Not air raids, but full-scale air warfare. These marauders are leaving their British base in one of the hundreds of Allied operations which have just one objective, to obliterate the Luftwaffe. Classed as a medium bomber, the marauder packs a formidable bomb load and mounts 11 guns. Flak is coming. It is this systematic hammering that has cost Germany 725 fighter planes in a week and reduced her plane production by an estimated half. Today's target, an airfield in Holland. Another Nazi air base is being neutralized. Hangars and installations are blasted. Now the airstrip gets it. Beautiful job, but Flak has taken its toll. These Air Force pictures show a bomber, one motor shot out, limping home. Another casualty. Other planes in the formation throttle down to herd the cripples home. The home airport, two flares, that's trouble. The ambulance crew is on the alert. The landing gear shot out. It has to be a belly landing. And the youngest pilot from the field, he's 19, brings her in. Slowly, surely, operations like these are squeezing the life from the Luftwaffe. There's a grim kind of excitement in the news these days as the tempo of the war quickens. You feel it in every newsreel, every headline. The hardest fighting lies ahead, we know it. And the hardest work. But that work and that fighting mean victory. This woman Marine is doing her job. These waves realize that this war will not be won by men alone. This spar is doing her part with the Coast Guard. And here are members of the Women's Army Corps doing their job in the Army. Here are women making the tools that our men fight with and doing it just as well as a man. And because of them, our men can be on their way. Hitler is under attack from all sides and is retreating. Tojo is retreating, but the Nazis and the Japs still fight back. This is the critical moment that military men mean when they say, victory goes to the side that can throw in the most reserves. American woman power is a reserve that can win this war. Go to 
to your local office of the United States Employment Services of the War Manpower Commission. They'll help you find a job that you can do where you'll be needed the most. Or enlist in the Women's Army Corps, or the Waves, or the Spars, or the Marines. But whatever you do, do it now. Do it now and you'll be taking part in the push toward victory. You'll make possible with the strength of your reserves a total victory in this total war for total freedom. The outpouring of America, industrial giant. New York Harbor teams with the cargoes of war bound for invasion. In England, after months of planning and preparation, it was D-Day minus two. General Eisenhower was about to unleash the most massive amphibious invasion in history. During the big build-up, England had become a vast staging area for troops and the materiel of war. Thousands of vehicles and ready-to-be-assembled combat-type aircraft. 20,000 railroad cars and 1,000 locomotives. 20 million square feet of covered storage and shop space. 44 million square feet of open storage space to hold the growing volume of supplies, wire, tires, bombs, shells, and other explosive devices. Awaiting invasion port embarkation were thousands of trucks and support vehicles, row upon row of tanks, and a wide range of artillery weapons. 170 miles of new railroad had been constructed to haul more than two million tons of supplies and combat hardware to the invasion ports. The United States Army had constructed 163 airfields in England for the Allied planes that were systematically bombing Germany day and night. Invasion directive issued by the combined chiefs of staff was concise. General Eisenhower had his orders. You will enter the continent of Europe and, in conjunction with the other Allied nations, undertake operations aimed at the heart of Germany and the destruction of her armed forces. Another American general was to have a central role in complying with that monumental order. General Omar N. Bradley field commander of American forces. D-Day minus one. Invasion forces began embarking in England. Destination, Normandy. Involved in this massive amphibious invasion were some three million soldiers, sailors, and airmen. 4,000 ships and boats. 20,000 vehicles of all types, and an endless list of combat support weapons. Operation Overlord, the code name for the invasion, was close at hand. Now, as D-Day and H-Hour approached, the final logistical operation was underway. In the darkness before dawn on June 6, 1944, the great invasion began to unfold. 17,000 men of the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions 
with over two million pounds of combat equipment and supplies, were airlifted to carefully selected drop zones behind the invasion beaches, where they were dropped to secure key road junctions and other strategic terrain objectives. The invasion armada, the largest ever assembled, was now in position off the coast of France. While our assault forces prepared for H hour, Allied naval power began their concentrated shore bombardment. amphibious warfare on a scale that staggered the imagination. Nothing like it had ever been seen. Beach in the first assault, 30,000 American troops stormed ashore. British and Canadian forces struck at three different beach sectors. At Utah Beach, 20,000 American troops were landed. By the end of the first day, our invasion force ashore totaled 120,000 men. With every passing hour, with each passing day, reinforcements streamed ashore to enlarge the beachhead with tanks, trucks, ammunition, and supplies. Hundreds of our attack bombers and fighters were now over Europe carrying payloads of destruction aimed at the vital centers of Hitler's fortress Europe. in heavy formations cascaded 3,500 tons of explosives, a ton every second, upon Nazi-held positions. Our mass bomber formations were now given a canopy of protective air support by P-38 Lightnings. Together, they fought off enemy air attacks.
as the roar of engines and concussion of the bombs were still ringing in the ears of a dazed and battered enemy, our ground artillery opened up. Our tanks and infantry rolled forward, driving west to isolate Brest and other ports on the peninsula. Other elements pushed south and east toward Paris. What was left of 10 German divisions was mopped up by the very men their Fuhrer had told them were not soldiers and would not fight. Again, the aggressor had made a slight miscalculation. the Germans were meeting disaster in northwestern France, the United States 7th Army, combat-hardened veterans of the fighting in Italy, hit the beaches in southern France on the morning of August 15th. During that day, 50,000 men and their equipment were landed. The American 6th Army Corps pushed north along the Rhone River Valley. And other troops moved eastward toward the Italian border. The drive into the heart of France was deeper now. Patton's Third Army angled toward points just east and south of Paris. The First Army flanking the Third. The Seventh now was moving up swiftly from the south. after the landings in southern France, Paris was liberated after four years of Nazi occupation. of Paris, like the liberation of Rome less than three months before, was a cause for rejoicing, and its psychological effect was reflected throughout the free world. Canadian troops slug it out with the Nazis in western France. Watch enemy sniper bullets ricochet off that wall. Snipers are driven from a chateau. Thousands of Nazis surrender. Trapped in a pocket south of the river, the remnants of von Kluger's 7th and 15th armies are driven across the Seine. There, another trap threatens Rouen and La Havre and robot bomb bases along the coast. For the Allies, it's a big cleanup. Farther east, Yanks are welcomed by Russian women from Leningrad. Brought to France as slave labor, their ages run from 15 to 60. Free from the beatings they received when they refuse to work, they await transportation home. In historic shock, everybody takes to cover when snipers fire from the cathedral tower.
The snipers are driven from cover. Yanks used only small arms in order to spare the cathedral. The island seaport has been doggedly defended by a fanatic Nazi, Colonel Andreas von Aurok, called the Madman of San Malo. For two weeks, the mad colonel and his 600 troops have held out in the old fortress against heavy Allied attack. Heavy bombing and shelling finally ends the siege. White flag signals surrender. Von Olach sent a message that he would not give up until his ammunition and brandy ran out. Some of his gallant troops did their best with the brandy. The Allies bagged thousands of prisoners in their swift drives to the battlefields of World War I. Among our troops, who paraded so proudly down the Champs-Élysées, were some whose fathers had followed the same flag down that famous avenue a quarter of a century before, celebrating another victory, which they too had won in the best traditions of the American fighting man, and who had come there not for conquest, but to liberate. But the men of our fighting forces knew it was only one more important milestone along the rugged road to victory. Allied armies held bridgeheads all along the line of the Seine. In the south of France, they captured Toulon. And Marseille. The British and Canadians took Brussels and the great port of Antwerp. The first American army pushed across the border into Belgium and drove on to Liège. The third took Verdun. The third, having crossed the Meuse River, reached the Moselle. Now the Allied front ran on a line all the way from the Swiss border to the North Sea. Seventh Army patrols coming up from the south met patrols from the Third Army. The two armies were now linked up for the coordinated offensive to come. Retreat for Nazi forces caught on the wrong side of the line was cut off. We rounded up our share of prisoners. The desperate plight of Hitler's armies became more apparent as the bewildered legions of a once mighty, destructive force found themselves defeated by an army they had been repeatedly told would never last on the soil of the Third Reich longer than nine hours. In the 97 days since the 5th Corps had led the assault on Omaha Beach, it had come nearly 500 miles and now drove across the German border and stood on the soil of Hitler's Germany. Who was it that once said the American was no soldier?
War Mobilization Director Burns warns America against overconfidence. The war is going well. We have the enemy on the ropes. He is dazed. His knees are buckling. This is the time to finish the job. The battle for France was nearing its end. The battle for Germany was about to begin. The Nazi Reich was soon to reap full measure of the dragon's teeth it had sown. Our armies were battering at the gates of the Nazi homeland. General Hodge's first army drove through the vaunted Siegfried line. Mile upon mile of concrete fortification and anti-tank emplacement through the city of Aachen. Two years and seven months after General MacArthur had left the Philippines, he kept his promise to return. Terming him the savior of their country, Australians pay tribute to a great American, General MacArthur. Two years ago, when I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Tonight, I repeat those words. I shall return. Nothing is more certain than the ultimate reconquest and liberation from the enemy of those and adjacent lands. On the 20th of October, 1944, his forces invaded the island of Leyte. This, too, was to be no easy parade to victory. Our soldiers were to face an enemy who would fight as their leaders ordered them to fight to the death. They wanted it that way. They were to get what they asked for. Seven days after MacArthur landed on Leyte, the United States 3rd and 7th fleets dealt the Japanese Navy its death blow in the battle for the Leyte Gulf. A mighty carrier, part of the great U.S. naval fleet protecting the landings of MacArthur's men in the Philippines, prepares to loose its power on the attacking Japs. Among the carriers are three thirsting for revenge, carrying proud names, the Lexington, the Wasp, and the Hornet, namesakes of those previously sunk by the Japs. Now, with their planes over the Philippines, they have a chance to settle old scores. Our forces at Leyte are threatened by Jap ships and planes. The USS Princeton is bombed. damaged the Princeton so badly she had to be sunk by her sister ship after her magazine blew up. (laughs) 
On another carrier, damaged hell divers make spectacular landings. These are official Navy pictures. Watch the prop bite the deck. This was part of the greatest air-sea battle the world ever saw. It cost the Japs 62 naval vessels sunk or seriously damaged. Vice President Wallace and the new Vice President, Senator Truman, head the greeters on hand to welcome home President Roosevelt. Returning to Washington for four more years, the President is cheered by a crowd estimated at 200,000. A victory emblem is formed by motorcycles. The president's return to the capital follows our first wartime election since Lincoln. His first public function is a tribute to the unknown soldier on Armistice Day. At Arlington National Cemetery, he and other dignitaries pay homage to those who died in our First World War. In the midst of another terrible conflict, we don't forget those who died in the First World War. British Marine Commandos close in on Valkyran Island, last Nazi stronghold in the Shelda Estuary. Typhoons dive bomb German batteries. This last desperate operation is designed to clear the port of Antwerp. German guns rake the boats, point blank range. The attack, which has been compared to Dieppe and Tarawa, took a toll of 20 out of every 25 landing craft. In this attack, landings were also made by elements of the Canadian First Army at Flushing. Landings complete, the battery opens up on retreating Nazis. Vescapella is captured at Antwerp. Supply key to the attack on Germany is open. One of the first small countries to fall into Nazi hands was the German border Duchy of Luxembourg. With the Nazis driven out, the capital city turns out to welcome the Allied liberators. Prince Felix and exiled officials return to take over the government. Following a speech by the prince, the crowd shows its hatred of the Nazi. Just beyond the border, the Siegfried Line looms before the advancing Yanks. Tank barriers bare their teeth. Though the Siegfried Line is a tough nut to crack, the Yanks discover the secret and move on through the first defenses. A wedge here and a wedge there, and the west wall begins to weaken. Even steel and concrete can't keep the Yanks out of Germany. The curtain was rising on the last fast-moving act of the drama of World War II. General Patton's Third Army took Metz. Ahead was the nearby Saar Basin. Germany's second most important industrial district. On the other side of the world, Army B-29 bombers from new bases on Saipan showered bombs on Tokyo. A fiery rain from the heavens to avenge Pearl Harbor. The campaign on Leyte was going well as our forces moved on, capturing the Japanese base at Ormok along the west coast. Other forces landed on Mindoro Island with no losses. While General MacArthur's forces were driving forward in the Philippines, 
Patton's Third Army penetrated the Saar and drove on across the Saar River. A record-breaking fleet of 1,600 United States heavy bombers blasted Frankfurt and other German cities. The Nazis were reaping a bitter and devastating harvest from the seeds they had once sown from the air. Now the very perpetrators of aerial blitzkrieg saw their own cities reduced to rubble. To the millions of Nazi war victims, here at last was a measure of retribution against their merciless executioners. Some of the bitterest fighting of the war took place on the Cologne Plain. Our push toward the industrial roar was resisted every step of the way. Then, on the 16th of December, 1944, the German counteroffensive struck. German Field Marshal von Rundstedt suddenly sent a dozen elite divisions smashing into the Ardennes sector. had cast the dice for high stakes, crossing the Meuse River, driving toward Liège, and trying to cut the Allied communication lines from Antwerp to the front line. If our lines of communication could be cut, the fate of our armies might be in the balance. This was the Battle of the Bulge. Combat and non-combat troops were suddenly and necessarily fighting side by side in worsening winter weather. Grabbing their weapons, they dug in and responded to the old military axiom of hanging on to buy time until reinforcements would come. General Eisenhower took immediate action to meet the crisis. He put the 1st and 9th Armies north of the Bulge under command of Field Marshal Montgomery's 21st Army Group with orders to attack from the north. Patton's 3rd Army was to attack from the south. Two airborne divisions were rushed in. The 101st was ordered to hold the vital communication center at Baston. It was during this action in besieged Baston that General McAuliffe, who was then commanding the 101st, made his famous reply to the German demand that he surrender. That reply was reportedly one word long, nuts. If the enemy did not immediately understand the meaning of McAuliffe's typical American reply, the action which followed undoubtedly convinced him that it meant that the Americans had no intention of surrendering. Just six days after von Rundstedt had launched his counteroffensive, Elements of Patton's Third Army, racing up from the south, struck the German on his southern flank. The pressure was off the 101st Airborne. The 
advanced American army attacked from the north. After the British struck the bulge on the west, the third army smashed on north to link up with the first army. Then the weather cleared and our planes took to the air, blasting von Rundstedt's forces. battle of the bulge was soon over. The enemy was retreating. The Germans had thrown their last big Sunday punch of the war. <laughs> 